I mean, you, you've been friends with, you know, as well as your own success, friends with so many key people in, yeah. in that. The, and rock and roll was starting in this country. You know, that's, that's when everything changes. Um, but I, I wanted to save the best till last, which yeah. is to go back to, to the very beginning and talk about Lonnie Donegan. Oh. And the guy who, who really does change everything. I mean, Lonnie, what can I say? Uh, having having got the record Rock Island Live and having become a skiffle group, uh, we were totally besotted with Donovan. I mean, we got his first album, we learned every song on it, and, and we're doing skiffle. We got into the World Skiffle Championship pretty well. And Lonnie's first variety appearance. So this is away from being with Chris Barber and his jazz band and doing stuff. This was Lonnie on his own, topping the bill in the big theatres, Liverpool included. Yeah. And he made his debut at the Nottingham Empire, which was a lovely old theatre. And I found out that he was... First of all, we went to see him in Leicester at the Dunford Hall doing a one-nighter. And Brian Locking, my bass player, Licorice as we call him, uh, he's with me and Roy is with me as well. And we go. And Licorice comes out and all he can do is talk about Mickey Ashwood, who was a great showman. I mean, a brilliant showman. And all I could do was talk about Lonnie mm -hmm. and the electricity that he generated with his audience. And Roy was the same. And we were sort of high on it. So he comes to Nottingham and I arranged through the bank of mum and dad to go to all 12 performances <laughs> Monday through Saturday. And uh, I lived 20 miles away, 25 miles. So I had to get a train. And the last train back was something like about 10 minutes after the show finished. So I was cutting it fine. So I saw him the first two nights. And really, I can't explain it. It was like, I'd been moved to another planet. I was just totally out of my head in what I'm hearing. I can't really, the excitement was just intangible. It was just unbelievable. When he started off and the curtains opened and the sound came out, Danny Wright, got him, Mick Nichols, um, Mickey Ashman on the bass, and Lonnie, it's the, it's the complete sound. Yeah. And, oh my God, this is so. I did Monday and Tuesday nights, but between shows, I used to queue to get his autograph. So the first flight, get his autograph. Couldn't go after the second show because I had a train to catch. Yep. Second night, did the same. Then on the Wednesday, I thought, oh, God, I haven't really spoken to him. I know I want to speak to him. So what I did was, I thought, to hell, I'll get home somehow. So what I did was, oh, no, no, sorry. So... I thought the Wednesday night, I'd try and do something different and, and you know, see more of him. So I went to the queue for the first house, people, and I kept going to the end, back of the queue. So when I got to the end, there was nobody else waiting for their autograph because the two previous nights, like, okay, thanks, sir, next. You know, it was like yeah. The third night, I kept walking to the back of the queue. And I said, he says, I've seen you before. I said, yeah, last night and the night before. He said, oh, he said, you must be a fan. I said, I said a fan? You know, <laughs> come on in. I'll take you backstage. So he took me into the theatre, got me in his dressing room, asked me everything about what I did, whatever. And I said, oh, you know, at the end of this, I said, that's fantastic. Well, I told him I had a skipper group. He said, I'd love to hear it. I said, really? He said, yeah, I would. He said, I'll tell you what, can he get here for 11 o'clock on Saturday morning? I said, oh, yeah, but not knowing if I could. Yes, who cares? He said, well, he said, I'll tell you what we'll do. He said, you come here for 11 o'clock. He said, I'll meet you in the espresso bar around the corner at half 10. He said, and I'll meet you at 11.30, and I'll come and listen to your back. So I went back and told the lads. So we did all the, it's all the um, instruments in and everything. We drove on the Saturday morning to the Empire. It used to be a little 
alleyway at the back, went in, and then we walked round to where the coffee, espresso coffee shop was, and we waited. And who should walk in? Not only Lonnie, but Mickey, Nick, and uh, we've forgotten. Anyway, all three, all three of his skiffle group. Yep. Come on, sit down and have coffee with them. Right, let's go and have a listen to you guys. So we went round, set the gear up quick. Not, not a lot of set up. Uh, and by now, Licorice was playing the double bass. She got on the double bass. And we sang. I sang, I forget what I sang now. And neither of the other boys could remember either. They were as over as I was. But uh, we sang the one. And Lonnie said, yeah, that was good. What else you got? So then we sang a second. We did a second. And then he called me over. And he said, you're good. I said, oh, really? He said, you're a good crew. I said, wow. He said, but vocally, he said, um, the guy on the other guitar is not strong. He's not a strong guitarist. And the drummer uh, who was, was actually playing drums, like Nick Nichols, said he needs a lot of, you know, experience in other words he was saying licorice and i would make it yeah so i said uh oh okay he said don't tell the lads it's take because it can improve he said but that was a really good audition he said and uh, you two guys could make it he said oh thank you so we packed the gear up and off we went well i've now come into the business uh i'm doing okay. I've got done some TV work. I hadn't really had a major record release yet. And then there was a magazine called the Disc Magazine, mm. which came out once a week. And it was a launch party for this new magazine. And everybody, but everybody was in the, uh, on the invite list for that. And, you know, I mean, all the the K sisters, the, I mean, big, big names for the time, big, big names. Um, so Brian Licorice and I, we, we were still hanging out together when the other two boys went back home when we didn't sort of quite get where we wanted to. And, uh, Licorice and I go together. And as we walk in through the door, a voice shouts, I told you you'd make it. And it was Lonnie. Wow. So we went in and uh, he said, I told you guys you'd make it. I said, what happened to the other two? He said, well, exactly what you said, you know, weren't quite strong enough. He said, well, good for you. So, I mean, I was overawed with this. Wow. So the next thing I know is uh, I've, I've seen a lot of the intermittent periods in the coming years, and then we were built together. At uh, near Grantham, where I come from, originally, we were billed. Uh, they had a festival at Belton Park, and somebody on the council who promoted it said, "Vince, would you like to do a gig?" So we all about it. I said, "Oh yeah." He said, "Top of the bills, Lonnie Donegan." I said, "Oh, fantastic! I've not seen Lonnie for about fifteen years." So I said, "Yeah, definitely. Look forward to that." So we did the gig, and uh, I'm in the, the little tent for us, little mini marquees to change in. I hear a voice say, and where is the bleeder? Where's this <laughs> around in your loose business? And he was a bit amazing. Like, where are you? Where? So I said, I'm in here. He said, oh, good. So I went in. <laughs> and he threw his arms around me, the little guy. And he said, God, he said, I told you you'd make it. And that bloody licorice. I said, yeah, and I said, all down to you, you know. He said, well, thank you. that's nice. So we got talking. He said, we still haven't done the show together. I said, no. He said, we've got to sort something out. I said, okay, we'll sort something out. Well, two weeks later, I got a phone call from Lonnie's manager, and he said, Vince, how would you like to do a few songs with Lonnie at the Nottingham Royal Concert Hall? on such a date, October. So I said, 2003. So I said, yeah, I'd love to. I said, right. So go along about half full, 
be able to run through two or three numbers with him and he wants you on the bill. I said, oh, great. So my wife and that and I go, we sh we're shown in to the backstage and uh, Pete's, oh, I just there. Joe Brown's old bass player is now playing for Lummy, Pete Oakley. And he's the guy that wrote Picture of You. And he was playing for Lummy. So he said, ah, Vince. So we got chatting. He said, what are you up to? I said, well, his master's, you know, summoned me. He said, <laughs> oh, great. He's written a couple of numbers. I said, think so. Oh, Joe did a few weeks ago. I said, oh, right. So then the, Lonnie's manager said to me, Vince, we've got a problem. I said, what? He said, well, Lonnie's been very poor in the last two days, but he's still worked. He said, but he's seen a doctor today. We're not sure if the doctor will give him the guy out to work. So, you know, we might be in trouble. He said, would you agree to doing more numbers than we, we discussed? Well, let me discuss. I said, well, yeah, Jim Skiffle, I can get it. He said, okay, that's great. He said, it's, it's comforting to know. So my wife and I, just before the show, we went up to the bar, and I was sat at the bar, and uh, she said, well, what if they want you? It's a bit late. You're, it's only 45 minutes to the show. I said, well, somebody will fetch us. I told them. And then sure enough, a few minutes later, a guy comes up and said, oh, you want it backstage? Go backstage. Will you do some numbers? We ran through a few numbers. And so uh, I said, OK. So I stayed backstage for a while. And then I heard that Lonnie had got back. That he, that he was there and that he was going to be, be okay to go on. So Annette and I went and took our seats and we watched the show the whole first <coughs> interval. I went round the back said, right, stay. Lonnie well, wants you to do two or three numbers with him. I said, okay, and you're on after so-and-so. Forget who it was. Oh, no, you're on it, not after so, after a certain song. I think it was, uh, oh, yeah. Anyway, with, with one of his songs, Cumberland Gap. That was the song, Cumberland Gap. You'll be able to come. I said, okay. So I'm on the side stage, and he introduces me. Lovely intro, really nice. So I got all proud. I'm going to sing with my kid, you know. And we did three or four numbers, and they went to the storm. And I came off, and my wife said, oh, that was great. So we're sat in the middle of the storm. She sat there. So I went to watch him through the middle of the store. And he was just best I'd ever seen. Best yeah. I'd ever seen. Just brought the house down. So just as he's taking his bows, or he finished his number and started his bows, I went round the back with Annette, and we go around the backstage to greet him coming off. And he eventually comes off. He's getting such a reception. And eventually he comes off. And then when I put my arm around him, I said, man, that was awesome. He said, yeah, it was great fun, wasn't it? Now, his bass player was Peter Oakman, who used to play for Joe Brown. And Peter, I know very well, and he was a super guy. And uh, he comes off, he's been playing bass for him. And he comes off and he said, now, oh, there's one thing I've missed, the most important bit. Apparently, the doctor said, that he had some tablets to take and he took them anally up his arse. Right? Yeah. I'd, I'd never heard of this, but apparently it, it, it doesn't exist, this tablet. So he's told to do this. So he comes off stage with Peter Oakman and I'm talking with him, I've got my eye on all that. This and Peter Oakman comes up and says, Do you know something, Lonnie? I said, What? He said, what you should do before every show is stick a tablet up your ass because that is the best I've ever seen you work. <laughs> Even his band would draw yeah. them. And Pete and everybody he said, yeah. So we said our, you know, thanks and I could get going. And uh, we went to an Indian restaurant and sure enough, he, he turned up there as well with some people. And uh, we said, I again. And that was that. And the following day, which was a Thursday, Annette and I flew to Lanzarote, and uh, that we we flew on the 
Friday. That was we flew, and uh, on the Monday we're down by the pool, and we didn't have a mobile phone, and uh, give me the phone. And it's um, it's my son to tell me that Lonnie's passed away, just like that. Yeah, that was that, and uh, I cried. I broke down. <laughs> And uh, it was a tough one. It was a mm. tough one. You know, having all those years of supporting somebody and idolizing them. Yeah. To be invited by them to come and sing with them. And now in the knowledge that it was the last show he ever did. So yeah. I saw the first Lonnie Dunning yeah. writer show. Of course. Right. Yeah. And he had such a profound impact on your career as well. Oh. Everybody. I mean, Joe Brown, you know, we, we talk amongst ourselves and it's, it's so many guys were influenced by it. And, and do you know the nice part about it was? He was always generous to his fans. Yeah, you know, yeah. Very, you know, we would sign on to Augusta, all sorts of things, as with me. Yeah, come and play for us. I know there are other bands I've found out since it did that. I mean, he was such a genuine home living guy and um yeah i'm just pleased to say that i've worked with his son since then peter uh, yeah a lovely guy um and you know he's obviously so proud of his father and I'm rightly so of his wife and and others but he he was it, it i can understand when people say they're they're a fan of somebody you can soon, you can actually tell by the way they speak about them, whether yeah. they're a true fan or they just jumped on the bandwagon. It so often happens in, in, in our band. Of course. Yeah. You know, Billy, Billy loves Skiffle, Marty loves Skiffle, Joe Brown idolized Skiffle. Yeah. We're all Skiffers. Tommy Steele plays Skiffle. You know, I don't play yeah. with the Skiffle group, the worried men. Yeah, Skiffle started everything. Lonnie Donegan started, but as, as George Harrison said, you know, no Lead Belly, no Lonnie Donegan, no Lonnie Donegan, no Beatles. Absolutely, absolutely. It's good. There's so many like that, you know. So yeah. many people came through it, and uh, oh, I used to, I used to love playing Skiffle. Still oh, it's gr great fun. It's and that's that's now that I'm getting the chance to play with the Quarry Men, you know, that I've always loved listening to the Skiffle anyway. And you can just say, we always start with Maggie May, when, and you're open up with that. And straight away, the audience is clapping away. And, uh, and you see everybody smiling. Yeah. And it, it, it's fun. And I, I really understand how Lonnie introducing Skiffle brought so much fun and a love for music for generations. 